This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. So many forms of violence. For us, resilience is more than a noble trait. It's a lifestyle that oppression has demanded of us. Either we adapt or we die. Even so, we need not be mere caricatures. Our stories matter, despite what the rest of society would like us to believe. So here I present to you a series of my musings, misfortunes, triumphs, disappointments, delights, and resurrections. I have pieced this all together to the best of my ability, but I also acknowledge that memory is tricky, slippery, alive, and ever-changing as the years pass. We all see different versions of the same thing. I have written the truest book I was capable of creating. It's the way I've always made sense of the world and my life. Thank you for being on this earth with me. The Year My Vagina Broke On a crisp fall day during my senior year of college, I called a local feminist clinic in a state of panic and described in great detail what was happening to my vagina. I was standing outside one of my classes, hoping no one would hear me chronicle the goings-on of my nether regions. Weeks prior, I had begun experiencing an itching and burning sensation, and I very quickly concluded that I had an STD. The woman on the line was patiently reassuring me that it was likely a garden variety vaginal infection, but I wasn't convinced. To me, garden variety made it sound like what was happening between my legs was fecund and beautiful when it was most definitely not. Are you sure? I asked, pacing, autumn leaves crunching under my feet. What if it's an STD? Just the thought of it filled me with shame and disgust. It didn't matter that I had had sex with only one person who was a virgin with a condom in the last few months. I was convinced I was a diseased degenerate. Even though I considered myself a feminist, and it was 2005, and I knew that sex, even the casual kind, was not inherently evil or immoral, I believed that God or the universe or perhaps my pious female ancestors from the great beyond were punishing me for putting out cochina, I thought to myself. For the first three years of college, I commuted to campus on the train from my parents' house. It was not at all what I wanted, but I couldn't afford to live in student housing or rent an apartment, not even the dankest of hovels. I hatched all sorts of plans and schemes to gain my independence, but the meager wages I was making from my part-time job at the university registrar weren't enough to keep me from being broke. So I was stuck living with my parents. And they weren't exactly raking it in as factory workers, so there was no possible way I could ask them for money to move out of their perfectly good house. That was some white people shit. I just spent the summer leading up to my senior year studying abroad in the city of Oaxaca on a big, fat student loan. So living at home for my last year of college began to feel absurd. I had wandered across Mexico alone, nursing a broken heart after my boyfriend of two years told me he didn't love me anymore and quickly replaced me with the homely white girl. For weeks, I partied with the rich Mexican friends I'd met while sobbing on the beach one afternoon. I drank so much mezcal that I gave myself pancreatitis and had to be hospitalized. I had lived. Now I'd suddenly be informing my parents of my whereabouts. And at 21, nah. So early in the year, I packed my things and moved in with a friend who lived in an apartment across the street from our old high school about a mile away. My parents were livid. Old school Mexicans, they considered my leaving home simply because I felt like doing so, a violation of my role as a daughter. 
In their eyes, I was both ungrateful and disrespectful, which wasn't entirely untrue, but not because I was moving out. Leaving home at this